Hey, I'm Steve Mould. I'm Helen Arnie. I'm Matt Parker, and we are back with a podcast of Unnecessary Detail, the self-deprecating title that, even in the third series, is still surprisingly accurate. This time, we have released the brakes and stepped on the gas to go more detailed and more unnecessary than ever before. I'll be talking about the international beef between Paris and London over who gets to be zero. I'll be exploring the Earth versus asteroid beef. And I'm playing a song about the women astronauts who never went to space with added beef. All right, let's get going and beef up the detail. So Matt and Helen... What do you understand the Greenwich Meridian line to be? It's a great, great circle. It is a great circle. That's one thing. What? It's a line. It's in Greenwich. It's literally like 20 minutes from my house. So I think I, I know this. It's not a circle. What Matt's getting is it starts at Greenwich or it passes through Greenwich, but it goes around the whole earth. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. But, and passes through Greenwich. That's a circle. That's a circle. And I'm saying great circle because it's you can draw lots of circles on a sphere. But the ones that are a bit like the equator, if you will, not to be orthogonal to what we're doing here, but <laughs> the ones that are the, the, the longest distance of the great circles, they're which are the equivalent to a straight line. Well, they're the largest possible circles on a sphere, aren't they? Okay, now I understand. So if you want to have something, something analogous to a straight line on a sphere, it's a great circle in that the shortest distance between any two points on a sphere is a great circle. <laughs> I kind of wish I hadn't asked this question because I... I didn't want to get diverted into a conversation about maths. I know it's very difficult when you're talking to Matt, but... It's been a great conversation. (laughs) What does the Greenwich Meridian line represent? Ah. It represents a certain point in history where the world agreed (laughs) that Britain was the most important naval power (laughs) and that was where time would be measured from. And f- That's not where yeah. we celebrate London being better than Paris. <laughs> yeah. It's not a <laughs> it's not a terrible summary. So it's part of the coordinate system that we use on Earth, right? So if you want to pinpoint the location of something on Earth, you say this is its longitude, this is its latitude. So you might know that the equator has a latitude of zero. That's like the horizontal plane through the centre of the Earth. And if you travel up north, the latitude increases until you get to the North Pole, which has a latitude of 90 degrees. The South Pole is minus 90 degrees latitude. And that all makes sense. Like It it makes sense to stick zero on the equator. But longitude is different because longitude is the measure of how far around the circumference of the world are you. So, for example, you've got these observatories in different cities you've got one in london in greenwich you've got one in paris these observatories are talking to each other all the time they're making measurements but the sky looks different because they're observing from different places not to overstate things but we get the equator for free because the earth is spinning that's a good way of putting it yeah because otherwise a sphere is a sphere like you you, every point's the same Yeah. yeah but if you spin it suddenly you've got an agreed axis and equator but you only get one of those for free. You don't get the second one. So with longitude, there's no obvious zero, right? But it's possible to talk about relative longitude of all these different places. So you'd say the observatory in Greenwich is 2.34 degrees to the west of the observatory in Paris. And you can say that to talk about the relative position of the observatory in New York versus Paris, you know, Greenwich versus New York. You can compare all these things relatively, But instead of talking about relative longitude, wouldn't it be better for everyone just to agree on a zero somewhere? This was all being hammered out in the late 1800s. The French wanted zero degrees longitude to be at the observatory in Paris. The British wanted zero to be at the observatory in Greenwich. In the end, it was agreed that zero would be at Greenwich on the understanding that Britain would convert to the metric system. What? 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 Yeah. No. About 100 years later, they got right on that. What? So <laughs> <laughs> you're kidding. So it's like a horse trading. I mean, like international diplomacy, anyone agreeing anything, there's is a complete nightmare. Yeah. Just look at any large political union that we happen to be an <laughs> island next to. So they, they were like, okay, I'll give you this if you give me that. That's that's phenomenal. Pretty much. Wow. Yeah. We lost our pounds yeah. and ounces, but we got zero. We got a great <laughs> yeah. circle. We got a great circle. What is zero, <laughs> if not a great circle? 
Anyway, I thought this was pretty cool. So I thought I'd go there with my phone, stand on that line at the Greenwich Observatory, look at my phone and go, oh, look, my longitude is exactly zero. (laughs) So I went there and it isn't. I looked at my phone and the flipping number isn't zero. I stood there for ages and it didn't change. And then I got out my other phone because I have two phones because I also deal drugs. And um, <laughs> and it, it said the same number on, on the other You're phone. Kidding. So I walked, huh. I walked uh, 102 meters to the east. And that's where I got zero. 102 meters and, to the east. Yeah. That's like halfway down the hill. That's like a field. Yeah. Matt and I both know the Greenwich Observatory really well as well. Like, yeah. Matt, you've been there, you've done stuff there. And I assume your wife also is a regular. <laughs> I can go there without my wife and still hear her because she's voiced some of the displays. <laughs> her voice is in yeah. the observatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So if your wife is travelling and you miss her, you go to the <laughs> observatory. Go to you yeah, can yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear her talking about spaces, which is what she does normally. Very similar anyway. to what happens. At That's home. amazing. Yeah. And like, I go there quite a lot. I used to go there like before the pandemic with my with my daughter. We like had membership and everything. And we used to go there because she was obsessed with this display right next to the Meridian Line. This huge room of clocks. When my daughter was three, she was completely obsessed with that room of clocks. I had to take her there every weekend. It's amazing. There's always all the Harrison clocks, all of the longitude story of, of how yeah. they got a clock to operate at sea. They've got some like awesome like old 80s BT phones, Ugh. spinny dial ones where That's you have amazing. to scrape your nice. hand around to do the numbers and you can call the talking clock on them. It's very cool. And <laughs> like my three-year-old was obsessed with it, but she couldn't pronounce L's at the time. So we would sit on the bus on the way to Greenwich and she would shout, um, I'm going to see the big clocks, but just with no L's in that sentence. <laughs> no and I had to pretend that we were going to the city farm in Mudshoot, who had a very large collection of male chickens. So <laughs> just to let you know, like we are very familiar with that. And I am, I'm feeling betrayed that it's all a lie. Well, what's nice is because everyone has a smartphone now, you can go there and watch tourists be disappointed <laughs> when they start. <laughs> Oh, so it's like all of London. <laughs> <laughs> so why is the prime meridian not zero? When astronomers back in the day were defining the location of the prime meridian, they were doing it by pointing their telescopes directly upwards, like vertically upwards relative to gravity. They would look through this telescope that's pointing directly upwards in Greenwich and they'd wait for a specific star to pass across the viewfinder. They call these stars clock stars. And in Paris, they would do the same thing. They'd look vertically upwards and wait for the clock star. My daughter wouldn't call them that. But anyway, we'll just... (laughs) (laughs) But of course, that star would appear in the Paris telescope before it appeared in the Greenwich telescope Because vertically upwards in Paris is slightly different to vertically upwards in Greenwich. And you can use the difference in timing to work out that difference between those two local verticals. And from that, you can work out the relative longitude of these two observatories. So long as your clocks are synchronised, which they worked on as well. By the way, the telescope that points directly upwards is called a zenith tube. Because it's looking at the zenith, like the thing directly above. And you know it's pointing upwards because the main mirror is a bath of mercury. Wow. So the bath of mercury lies exactly flat, exactly horizontal relative to local gravity. Do they spin it to make it parabolic or is it just flat? I think it's just flat. You can do that. It's just one of the elements. And there's right. other focusing elements. Like a, oh, there'll, be, right. there'll be a main glass as well. I swear I heard uh, Zenith Tube on like Tom Robinson's Six Music Show the other day. <laughs> such, I'm going to have a band. It's the uh, Zenith Tube. <laughs> <laughs> so using these Zenith Tubes and everything, it all works very well, except there's a slight wrinkle. The slight wrinkle being local gravity. So if the Earth were perfectly spherical with perfectly uniform density, all gravity lines would pass through the centre of the Earth but the Earth is lumpy, so they don't. So when an astronomer is looking directly vertically upwards, that's relative to local gravity. And that line 
doesn't pass through the center of the earth, not quite. That's not really a problem until GPS comes along because GPS defines vertically upwards in terms of what the satellite can see when it looks down on the earth. Specifically, what does it see when it looks exactly vertically downwards? But exactly vertically downwards isn't defined in terms of local gravity. It's defined in terms of the center of the earth. If the satellite is pointing at the center of the earth, then it's exactly vertically downwards so far as the satellite's concerned. So you're saying... The astronomers used the wrong down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or maybe, well, it's hard to say. I mean, I suppose the centre of the Earth is probably the best kind of down. So they just used a different down. <laughs> yeah. Which meant they had a different up. So yes. telescopes were looking one up and the, t the satellites are looking at a slightly different down. Yeah, exactly. So you'd expect vertically upwards and vertically downwards to be perfectly parallel. But <laughs> because they're defining it differently, they're a bit skew with. And because it's important for the old system and the new system to be compatible, like in both systems, you need to be able to stand at zero in that system, look vertically upwards according to that system and still see exactly the same thing in the sky when you do that. So if you look vertically upwards from the old zero using the old system of local gravity as your definition of up, you'll be looking at the clock star at some specific time. So to be sure that you're looking at the same clock star at the same specific time at zero in the new system, where upwards is defined in terms of the center of the Earth, you need to shift that line over. And the amount that you have to shift that line over, in Greenwich at least, is 102 meters. So the reason GPS zero isn't the same place as old-fashioned zero is because the Earth is lumpy. So it has to be backwards compatible. Yeah. Otherwise, a whole lot of 18th century astronomy books would be obsolete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, few. <laughs> I feel like the answer to anything involving the Earth or its orbit, when you're like, well, why is it like this? And the answer is... The solar system is a lumpy, sloshy mess. Yeah. And we're always compensating for something. Like, if we were on a perfect sphere orbiting the sun in a perfect circle vertically. Yeah, and we weren't tilted slightly over. We, exactly. Yeah, there, yeah. Then everything would be nice and tidy. But no. Yeah. And wouldn't it be nice if the length of the day was a set number of whatever, you know, or there was a whole number of days in a year? But we don't get exactly. that. We get some <laughs> flipping. It's very near, but it's not quite. Ugh. But it's not quite in more than one way. And you're like, oh. <laughs> and then the Earth is yeah. slowing down as well. That doesn't help. Surely that's like that going to become a problem at some point. Don't they? They add like leap seconds, don't they? Every so often. But we keep moving bits of the Earth around, what? and that changes. Yeah, like if you build a big enough dam it changes the rotation uh. rate of the earth slightly and the leap seconds sometimes we got to add them in sometimes we got to take them out i'm against the leap second i think it's ridiculous i think it's pandering to astronomers <laughs> if you didn't have a leap second how yeah. often is a leap second typically i know it varies mm, every couple of years so if there's a, a leap second every couple of years and you don't do it don't you end up with like, oh, midnight's in the middle of the day after however many thousand years of... Partly no, because they go backwards and forwards. But as uh -huh. Helen said, we are on the whole slowing down. We're, we're gradually becoming tidally locked with the sun. Uh -huh. But it's on a scale. Like the time frames of that happening are well beyond yeah. other ridiculous things that Earth is doing. Like them, uh, I think they call them Milankovitch cycles where the orbit is processing you've got a bunch of other stuff going on i mean the other ridiculous thing that the earth does of course is daylight saving time like we, you know which is a shift of yeah. like 60 yeah. minutes twice a year yeah. <laughs> no but my, my point it's is like rashic. why why are we worrying about this one second every couple of years when er, twice a year we shift the whole thing by flipping, you know bingo and and it kind of made sense in the past like when the only people who cared were astronomers but now with <laughs> software has enough difficulty with time zones yeah. and daylight saving without having to put the occasional second coming and going into the mix. Yeah. And it's caused problems. Like it's, it's messed up software in the past. Mm. Uh, Google smears it 
Oh they do a God. leap second smear Ooh. where they very gradually add the second what? in. Over what, a over a period of, of like days or hours or? Hours, yeah. Because normally things like the clock in Big Man, that sort of stuff, it, it just counts. It goes, you know, 58, 59, 60, 0, 1. <laughs> and that just puts an extra, they go double count 0, basically. It's... <laughs> It's like a roulette wheel. Nice. It's a bit like, it reminds me of those lovely clocks at Swiss rail stations. They go a little fast over the minute. And then when the second hand reaches the top, it waits there. And it, it's allowed to wait there because it's been going a little bit fast over the minute. And it waits for a sinking signal that gets sent to all the clocks in all the train stations. Wow. So you're only going to be late within the finite speed of light <laughs> and if you're going somewhere within the minute you might be slightly early yeah <laughs> yeah well like i think there is something to say for the fact that the earth is slowing down that like every every day you have is your longest day on earth in an average Ooh, sense you know so deep. you yeah. should it grab sounds it sounds deep but when you analyze it <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's one of those things where you go oh uh. <laughs> Steve, have you considered setting up a rogue, unauthorized tourist attraction at the correct line? Yes, the Mold Meridian, I call it. <laughs> That's and it. it's just where I've scraped <laughs> yeah. a, a divot in the grass. Yeah. <laughs> Selling compasses. <laughs> You're a meridian truther. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just me with a megaphone and I've got my phone out going, Zero's yeah. over here. <laughs> Helen, you're working on a musical about space. I am. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can talk in extreme detail about this process because it is one of the most ludicrous things I've ever done. Uh, and it's not actually about space. It's about the 13 women pilots who were selected to be tested with the same uh, physical and mental tests as the first male US astronauts, but they didn't actually get to go to space. So oh, it's, it's no. actually not it's about, about not space. It's about not space. It's about... It's about should have been space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things. I don't want to give away the plot of the musical, but they don't go to space. And we find out why. <laughs> I've written a song, which is what I'm going to play for you. It's been a bit of a wild process why and how do I like turn a a really interesting real story from history into a show with singing and dancing and people hanging from a ceiling? Like, I don't know. How how would you do it? <laughs> I mean, just so you know, they'll be hanging towards the wrong down. <laughs> just, <laughs> just to preempt Steve's review. <laughs> Their down was off by 2.3 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what you're going to say when you come and see it. You'd be like, yeah, yeah, the aerial stuff was great, but, you know, it was aerial comparative to local gravity. Uh, my yeah. phone said something different. Uh, <laughs> and I'll be like, Steve, why were you looking at your phone in my show? So, <laughs> Yeah, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see one of those spinny cages on the stage. A spinny cage. That they, that they, put spinny astro- cage. they put astronauts in a spinny cage, you know, and it sort of spins in all different axes. Oh, like the uh, centre for you. I want someone training. singing in one of those. <laughs> Doppler effect, <laughs> the musical. <laughs> I just didn't understand the technical terminology you were using. Oh, there. no, Steve, sorry, no. <laughs> can you just um, sort of dumb it down for me? <laughs> is this spinny cage? Is that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Is that. A centrifuge is when you're on the end of a spinning arm. Is that right? Maybe the spinny cage centrifuge as well. Oh, yeah, okay. Know. I'll tell. I'll ask my director. They Great. almost certainly said no. So yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I am writing a show about these amazing thirteen women pilots. The song that I am going to play is weirdly not in the show anymore, oh. but it's a really lovely song because it's it's just about one of these thirteen pilots. Her name was Wally Funk, which is probably the best name of any pilot ever and great name for <laughs> the feature of a song yeah you really can't beat it unfortunately it, the song has almost no funk in it apart oh. from wally so <laughs> there's, there's definitely like a trick yeah. missed there like space well yeah. hang on i'll get to the plot twist in a minute oh yeah there's a plot twist wally funk was the youngest of these 13 pilots so she was in her early 20s when she was told you're going to do these tests we're going to find out whether 
a women can handle the same physical and mental tests as the first US male astronauts. And it's this very unofficial thing. NASA doesn't really know anything about it officially. The same doctor who did the tests for the first male US astronauts did the tests on these women pilots. And so she was one of the youngest women to do this. And my favorite of the 13, this is, I know I shouldn't have favorites. My favorite of the 13 is uh, a woman called Janie Hart, who was 40 and had eight kids. Wow. Wow. uh, When she was asked to do this test. And she was the oldest of the 13. And when a journalist asked her, why do you want to be an astronaut? She said, if you had eight kids, you'd want to go to space too. Um, (laughs) So these women are incredible. Um, But Wally Fung is particularly interesting because she was 22 when she did these tests. And what was so interesting about these tests, these 13 women, when you compared them to their their height and their weight, a lot of them did better than some of the male astronauts. All of them complained a lot less. And a whole bunch of them did way better in this particular isolation test that they did, where they basically had to lie in like a pool of water, the same temperature as their own body, until they either hallucinated or got out. (laughs) The male astronauts didn't do this test, but Wally Funk did this test. And she stayed in this isolation tank for like pretty much 10 hours like the oh, longest that right. they only got her out because they wanted to go home and to, to <laughs> right. give you an <laughs> to give you a comparison a journalist a male journalist did the same test as part of a thing to find out what it was like to do this test and after like a reasonably short period of time started hallucinating and uh, asked to <laughs> asked to leave so you know different people respond to isolation in different ways it's arguable that women are better placed to become astronauts because they're smaller they have tiny hands for the buttons <laughs> they produce less waste <laughs> they eat less and c- yeah. consume yeah they consume less water less energy less mass you know yeah, yeah. it's kind of genius I'm surprised the mother of eight didn't last longer in the sensory deprivation tank. Like I've got two kids. I feel like I could stay in there for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'd be like, I would pay to go in there. She didn't actually do it. Like only oh, okay. uh, a couple of them. Only just like Jerry Cobb, I think it was Real Woman and Wally Funk did the isolation test. Okay. Like only a few of them did. How do they determine if they're hallucinating? Like I can imagine one button that says, press this if you, you've had enough. It's like another button saying, are they in the tank with you? <laughs> <laughs> it can't just be like press if you're hallucinating. I guess not how that works. From what I remember of the the press article that I read about it, they they ask you every so often. They say like, "How are you doing? What are you right. thinking about?" Because it's it's also a psychological test. It's not just a test of like, can you stay in this tank for ages? It's like, it. what is your response to this situation of extreme sensory deprivation? So they don't want you doing that in silence. They kind of want to poke and find out like, oh. See so, how you're holding up, yeah. how you're responding, all that. Yeah. Things. Yeah. So it's really wild. And I now you've put it that way, Steve. I'm like, how can I get in one of these? Uh, <laughs> can I, when, when's my birthday? Can I buy an isolation tank? So yeah, there's these incredible pilots who did all these tests. And then the the, the whole program got cancelled for like, for reasons that you have to come and see the show when it's finished to... <laughs> To, to find out lots of things were at play it was partly money it was partly like the u.s desperately had to beat the russians to the moon mm. they desperately had to beat the russians into space which they actually didn't manage and so like they focused on only sending male fighter pilots so they had loads of data on into the space program mm. and they didn't recruit women because it would have just in more logistics to slow them down. So there's this attitude that equity came second to beating the Russians. No one can argue with that when the people who want to beat the Russians are the ones making the rules. A whole lot of other things like, you know, a bit of intergenerational feminism, um, a lot of (laughs) politics and just some straight up sexism (laughs) and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, you know, it picks up all of that. But this song itself is the first song we wrote for the show. And it is a duet between 22-year-old Wally Funk, the pilot who's told that she might be the first woman in space, and 82-year-old Wally Funk, who is about to be told that she is going to space. 
Oh, spoiler. Plot twist! Amazing. Because of all these 13 women who in early 60s were recruited to this space testing program, one of them did make it into space wow. and it was Wally Funk because in 2021 she was invited to take like the fourth seat in Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin rocket oh, like the wow. inaugural flight so it was like Jeff Bezos Jeff Bezos's brother some guy who'd paid 28 million pounds for their son to get the third place oh, wow. <laughs> like what and the fourth seat was given to what do you want? Yeah. Which is wild. And she became the oldest woman in space. In fact, the oldest person in space until William Shatner went up on the next flight. But anyway, oh, well. <laughs> um, so a brief period of time, the person who was told she'd be the youngest woman in space became the oldest person in space. Well, the thing I find really interesting about it is that Wally Funk, a few decades ago, bought a ticket for Richard Branson's... Virgin Galactic thing, yeah. It feels like... <laughs> Wally Funk has benefited from some kind of beef between <laughs> Bezos and Branson <laughs> about who gets to take this incredible person into space first. Bezos won, but wow. you know, didn't Wally as well. That's a good space race. Yeah, that's that that's one. an indiv individual space race. So yeah, so the this song is a, a 22-year-old Wally Funk duetting with a 82-year-old Wally Funk. So it's been really interesting recording it just for audio because like when you're on stage, you can see which one is the 22-year-old Wally Funk and you can see which one is the 82-year-old Wally Funk because you can see when they're moving their mouths. Uh, but <laughs> on a recording, you can't see that. So I, I, I found two singers who were incredible and had really different voices. So Charlotte Hannon has this amazing musical theatre voice. It's much more like striking. It's a very punchy voice. It sounds very musical theatre. And then Nora Perone, who has this beautiful, like, operatic soprano voice, like lots of vibrato, lots of flavour in her voice. And I hope she doesn't mind me calling it flavour. So she's singing the part of the 82-year-old Wally Funk. So kind of this musical theatre voice is the younger and this more um, operatic voice is the older Wally Funk. Rob Gathercole on the piano as well, I should mention that. Yeah, I think they've really done a smashing job. First time that I jumped out of a window I just turned five And gravity released its hold on me Oh boy, it was really something Life began right there and then I wiped my knees and climbed again Rising up and falling free I wanna Thank you. 
That's right, I do. I won't waste one second of my time. Oh, I'm sure of that, honey. I know that every life has limitless potential. If only others help them as they climb. I was born to fly. I was born to soar. Do everything that it is possible to do. What if it's not enough? It's enough. It's been exquisite. And you know what? The best bits are still coming for you. You ready? I'm always ready. So, what's in store? Oh, beautiful. It's going to be beautiful. Um, that was called Wally Funk's Race for Space. I and love it. Uh, it, the title comes from the book by Sue Nelson. So if you want even more detail about Wally Funk, uh, you can go find a book called Wally Funk's Race for Space, uh, which is about Sue and Wally taking a road trip across America and telling this whole story in extraordinary detail. I heard that musicals always have an. I wanna song. Is that what they call it? I wanna. Mm-hmm. Cool. That's a very rare thing, isn't it? And I want you it. It's very rare. It's like <laughs> it's it's. I mean, it's rare to the point of when someone does something really rare and new. Is it because they're at the cutting edge or because it's a they're idea. in the cul-de-sac? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's brilliant? Brilliant. Dot org. It's a site where you can learn interactively with fun, hands-on lessons in maths, science. Maths, computer science, and some maths. And interactive learning is way more effective than just watching lecture videos or listening to podcasts. Wait, is that true? It is. Wow. There you are. So you better check out the fantastic, interactive, and oh my goodness, so visually pleasing courses over on Brilliant.org. You want to learn logic? No problem. They have a course called Logic. It's a very logical title, and instead of just memorizing things, it teaches you how to think by guiding you through fun problems. Each of those problems comes with step-by-step solutions that help you understand the reasoning behind it all. So join the literally millions of people, and I mean literally, who are all learning the brilliant way. And if you go to brilliant.org slash A-P-O-U-D or click the link in the description, the first 200 of our listeners will get 20% off an annual membership. So there you are. Go. Get started for free with Brilliant's amazing interactive lessons. So, Matt, the first two parts of the show have been, as it turns out, almost entirely Earth-based. Do you, I feel do you, like you both failed to get to space. Yeah, we've absolute failure to lift off. I'm going right into space to look at some asteroids. Because, yes. I mean, the Earth, we have a love-hate relationship with asteroids. Yeah. They they really cause some damage every now and then. But as mammals, <laughs> it's worked out well for us in the long run. Yeah. You specifically, Matt, have a love-hate relationship with asteroids because aren't your wedding rings made out of... Oh, yeah. They're meteorite. Yeah. Sorry to go. keep bringing up your wife, but, you know, it's pretty she spacey She is episode. the more qualified space scientist. Let's be honest here. <laughs> Do you sometimes hold up your hand and say, hey, look what killed the dinosaurs? <laughs> Is it like that? <laughs> you have rings that are made of metal that came from an Earth landed meteorite, right? They're, yeah, they are prehistoric, but like maybe like tens of thousands of years ago, meteorite landing. And oh, wow. so much of this particular meteorite landed in Africa that if you go to a museum anywhere and they have a meteorite exhibition, it's more likely than not, in my experience, that they will have a chunk wow. of the Gibeon meteorite. And so yeah. Lucy and I will go and reunite our rings with <laughs> chunks of it in different... Because it floated through space for billions of years together. 
and now yeah. it's scattered around the earth. And we're like, hey, like a little reunion. And we go and like, it looks like That's we're great. fist bumping the meteorite. Um. <laughs> is the meteorite slightly magnetic? So is it actually drawing? It, it no, it, oh, my eyes might be slightly magnetic now because it's iron nickel. So mm. not, not all meteorites are necessarily metallic or will stick to uh, magnets, but ours will because of the, the iron nice. nickel uh, composition. Then you've got to have them backed with something, otherwise they'll rust. Contact your skin. Yes. And we were initially like, we're like, what if they just rust in general and look terrible? But we're like, well, you assign your own meaning to these things. If they end up terrible, yes. we'll get new ones. And yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so far, so good. Also, if something nice changes the way it appears, it's called a patina. Exactly. And then it's fine. It's patina. Yeah. Lucy came in one day and she's like, how did this dining room table get damaged? And it was because I had to file the burrs off a very large protractor I was making and I accidentally um, <laughs> scuffed the table. And I was like, it's just the patina of life. And she's like, that's your answer to everything that gets damaged. <laughs> like a wheel falls off the car. Yes, it's the patina, patina of, of life. life. <laughs> is it a more expensive metal than, obviously, a gold ring is expensive. Yep. Is it more expensive than that? No. It's, I mean, ours were made by some hippies in Arizona because you can buy this meteorite reasonably easy to use it in jewelry. And so we just kind of shopped around. And from memory, it was like comparable to having a gold wedding band. The only issue is initially when you get them, I forget the name of the pattern. It's like a, uh, begins with W. It's a type of pattern you only get because it's a crystal structure in the metal if the metal cools incredibly slowly. And that only happens if it's drifting in space. So you can tell it's not terrestrial iron nickel because of these these crystals wouldn't form um, on Earth. Mm. And the patina of life gradually covers that up. Ah. And so I, di- I keep thinking, because I know how thick it is. I, c- I can kind of calculate the you thickness. Buff it out. Yeah. You're meant to get it like if you see a meteorite on display, it'll have the pattern visible because it's been acid etched. So, so it comes out. I'm tempted to work out because we know our life expectancy. We know how much <laughs> metal gets taken off with each cleaning. We could calculate how many times we could get it. Like maybe every like tenth wedding anniversary or something, we get the ring re-etched. I feel the same way every time I get my floors re-sanded. Yeah, this is it. I did the same thing. I was like, how yeah. thick is the the wood on the top? And I'm like, well, that's only yeah. a couple sands. You know, <laughs> we're going to space them out. <laughs> I feel like I've put you completely off track. Completely I've derailed. absolutely sent you on a completely different direction. Yeah, okay. No, no, there's a good point here, though, because asteroid floating in space, lovely. Serene, metal cooling very slowly. Asteroid after it's landed, wonderful, turn it into a ring. Now, it's the transition from one to the other that causes problems. <laughs> <laughs> and ideally, we want to be able to understand and potentially stop this from happening. It's delightfully meta- that the way we would stop something slamming into Earth is by slamming into it first. So we need to understand impacts to be able to stop impacts. It's one of the things where you can't really just simulate it with experiments. Because if you do terrestrial impacts, if you did a bunch of impacts like in a lab, if you change the angle of the impact to coming in relative to the surface, the more oblique the angle, so like really like glancing blows give you much more elliptical craters and straight down blows give you more circular craters. And if you look at all the craters on the earth, you're like, oh, wait, they're all very circular. Oh, And so Mm. you might think, oh, that's interesting. And you're like, oh, well, maybe it means we just tend to get hit straight down. But that doesn't make sense from a objects from space point of view. Well, like perpendicular to earth, like what? Like like gravity. Everywhere on earth. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> it's a third type of down. Yeah. And, and then you're like, oh, maybe like oblique ones get filtered out because they have to go through more atmosphere so they don't make That it. was my theory. Yeah, because a lot of them break up in in, in the atmosphere, right? So the exactly. really big ones can just get completely shattered and, yeah. and fall in tiny, tiny bits, right? But yeah. It turns out it's just that when something is moving that fast, like kilometers a second... It's not a gouging action anymore. It's like a blast. And it's the Mm -hmm. kind of vaporization of all, like it's a massive shock explosion. And so even though it might have scooped out an elliptical hole, 
it blasts a circular hole, and it's substantially right. bigger than the size of the impact. Oh, wow. And that only happens at these kind of, I'm going to use the word supersonic, I mean, technically, literally, but I feel like it's understating what's happening in this situation, like incredibly <laughs> fast impacts. We can do so much doing physical experiments. We can do so much in simulations. But ultimately, like for all the mathematical models in the world, occasionally you've got to check it against an experiment. So what we're talking about here is like two things. We're talking about asteroids hitting Earth. Yep. And no matter what angle they hit at, they make a massive old crater. Oh, yeah. But also, are we talking about asteroids hitting each other in space or things hitting asteroids in space? Yes. And specifically, what we care about as a species is hitting some kind of impact that we have made into an asteroid to redirect it away from the Earth, to stop mm. it from putting a large circular dent in the Earth. So we're sending up like a robot or Bruce Willis to yeah. punch an asteroid in the nuts right in and the make face. it go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. Just to put it in really technical language. Yes, we want to kick it in the spheroids before <laughs> it slams into us. Yeah, got and it. And it's the kind of thing we want to practice first. Yeah. So, so we've landed. Actually, we've sent impactors before, but never deliberately to see if we can redirect a celestial body until. NASA sent the DART impactor. So this was launched in 2021. It hit an asteroid in 2022. It actually went for an asteroid pair. So two of them going around each other. There's a big one, Didymos, which is 780 meters across. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty big, but not massive. Like we've got buildings bigger than that. Like it's, you know, huge, but not ridiculous. It had a smaller, adorable asteroid going around it. Uh, Dimorphos, which is only 160 meters across. Mm. And we slammed into the smaller one. And the thinking was, if you slam into a big asteroid by itself, and you want to see how much you've deflected it, you've got to wait a very long time to see how much it's changed its trajectory, because it's only going to be a minute change. Mm. And so you'd be waiting just so long to see if it's going in a subtly different direction. In relation to Earth, right? In relation to Earth. But if you hit a binary system, you can just look at how the orbit has changed of them going around each other. Mm. And from that, you can get the momentum change of the individual asteroid. So they picked a small one going around a big one, hit the small one. And before the impact, it took 11 hours and 55 minutes per orbit. And after the impact... It took 11 hours and 23 minutes. So we knocked a solid half an hour off. Only a 12-hour orbit. Like, that's a big change. That is a load of leap seconds they're going to have to add to, like, (laughs) get get around that. Wow. We smeared a leap second (laughs) right across. (laughs) And actually, so, so before the impact, scientists were so excited about what was going to happen. There was a paper written titled... After DART, using the first full-scale test of a kinetic impactor to inform a future planetary defense mission. And this was 41 scientists from 30 different institutions writing a paper because they were just too excited to wait. And it's all (laughs) the things they can't wait to measure after the impact happens. Um, And this paper came out and then the impact happened. And then there was this gap where, like, the data's embargoed because the scientists are working on it. And, I mean, NASA's great. All the data gets released for free eventually. But initially, the scientists who are working on the project get first first call to go through the data and see what's going on. To just check that they haven't knocked it towards Earth. Yeah, I feel like NASA (laughs) redirects asteroid into Earth might be the worst PR disaster possible. (laughs) I'd struggle to think of a worse one than that. We often meet our fate (laughs) on the path we take to avoid it. (laughs) Wow. Wow. That's deep. Yeah. Yeah. Like the impact. (laughs) Um, So so I've met one of the scientists who worked on this paper, Sabina Radukin. She was at uh, AstroFest, which is a big astronomy festival that my wife helps organize and hosts. And I go as a plus one. Nice. I'm part of the SAPs, the uh, Spouses and Partners Nice. Who uh, hang out at various physics conferences. So you're the dimorphous to her 
Diddy Moss. <laughs> Correct. I orbit her and the period changes. <laughs> so I've had to fetch cups of tea for a lot of astronomers over the years. So I'm I'm like the runner, like nice. the I, I help with the tech. I bring cups of tea, and I, ch- I chat to the to the scientists. And so I was chatting to Sabina between talks. We were talking about the DART mission, and she said, "Oh, do you want to do you want to see some of the findings?" <gasps> and I was like, "Oh my goodness, I unreleased like you know we're talking embargo date." I'm like, "Yes, please." And it's now been published, so I can talk about it openly. But they had some of the data back, and okay, the data is a little bit minimal because. The impactor dart is was just a lump of spacecraft designed to slam into a rock. <laughs> if we're sending iPhones to Mars, this was a Nokia 3210 we lobbed at a rock. <laughs> it was meant to have a companion spacecraft that would show up and have a closer look at the asteroid afterwards. Mm-hmm. But for budgetary reasons, that wasn't launched. Yeah. It is going to be launched. We're launching it in 2024. To arrive at Didymorphos in 2026 to have a look at the aftermath. But when they cancelled it going at the same time, they put a CubeSat with DART that would detach before the collision and be able to watch the collision happen. Oh, cool. Except by the very design of the mission, it was coming in at six kilometers a second when it reached Mm. the impact. And this little CubeSat can't, like, it's doing the same speed. So it it raced by at six kilometers a second and frantically tried to take some photos <laughs> and then got shot out into space. So so all we got was a few grainy photos taken by the two cameras on the CubeSat as it now then hurtled far, far away. And on those, you can kind of see the plume of material coming off the asteroid after the impact. Because while we get the momentum change just by looking at the period we don't get the really the details of how that happened mm. because the, because the momentum change after is greater than the momentum of the impactor hitting the asteroid oh and so just naively you're like what you don't get you don't get momentum for free but there's there's a bigger change than you'd expect just from the impactor hitting it and that's because after the impact you get all this ejecta, like you rocks get uh, flung up. And so there's like a jet effect, like the impact crash site throws material away from the asteroid, and that gives you additional momentum change wow. to the main body. So it's not just a case of we threw a heavy thing and the thing we hit changes momentum. We need to understand what it's made of and how the impactor interacted with that, like what, how the crater forms. To then be able to generalize what happened to apply it to other asteroids in the future, which is the whole plan of this thing. And the angle was bigger than expected. So the plume, they expected the plume to be around a 90 degree cone from across the whole width of it. Because they were coming in largely vertical to the surface. Somewhere between like, between 60 and 80 degrees, which counts as largely vertical in this situation. And the actual plume was somewhere between 131 and 139 degrees. Ooh, so, so rather than being like a narrow cone, it was like a wide... Yeah. We did also get some backup shots from the Hubble that turned around and had a look as well. Nice. And we'll get the full details when um, Hera, the follow-on mission, gets there. But for now, Sabina's data shows it was a much wider angle than expected. And when I asked her about it, she said it's because the asteroid's so small compared to the size of the crater it's not like it's an impact on a flat surface where you can imagine material infinitely far in every direction which kind of like holds in the impact the surface curls away Mm. and so actually it's a smaller amount of material on the sides and that gets blasted out so her prediction is when we see it much more clearly it's less going to look like a crater in a big body and more just a whole side of it got blasted off. And and the nature of that blasting changes the momentum transfer and, and net change. And a lot of her work is then simulating what the composition could have been to see the results we get. And the thing is that there's multiple possible solutions to what the asteroid could have been that all give the same 
eventual momentum transfer. And so Sabina's got to look at the plumes from the data and then run a bunch of computer models to see what matches the most closely to be able to kind of reverse engineer what the material must have been originally in the asteroid. This is, feels like quantum physics, like you're not directly observing what the rock is made of, but yeah. by hitting it with something, you get yeah. way more information than just where it moved when you hit it. It's the CERN of <laughs> that story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You count all the yeah. particles and then you work out what must have been there to start with. <laughs> yeah. So I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> I may have to ask my wife, but I'm ready. <laughs> they obviously wanted to hit it bang in the middle. Was that achieved by the satellite being intelligent enough to make slight adjustments as it approached? Or was it just like, we're sending this thing off. We've done our calculations. We hope it hits in the middle. Like, And, and also, did it hit in the middle or was it off to one side? Like how? It hits pretty much in the middle. Uh -huh. Yes, it makes adjustments as it goes because we can't aim that well from this kind of distance. And the signals take too long to come backwards and forwards. Yeah. So it's not like there was someone with a joystick. <laughs> <laughs> they did very delightfully have a front-facing camera. And so you can look up the images because it was sending back yeah. the images. And so you get you get like a dot in the distance. And I remember this happening like as, it, as the collision was happening. There's like a dot in the distance and then there's a bigger dot and then a bigger <laughs> dot and then a bigger <laughs> dot. And then there's like, oh, that, that's an asteroid. And then you're like, oh, I can see rocks. And you, and then you get closer and closer and more and more detail. And like the last image is like the top couple lines of the image. And then <laughs> because it's like, you know, when the internet was so slow, images would load gradually from the top. Yeah. Yeah. It's that. But someone else picked up the phone <laughs> halfway through the transfer. In this case, it slammed into the asteroid before it could send the rest of the image. And so that's the final, the wow. final picture we get. I want to see that image sequence. That sounds amazing. It's really cool. We'll uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. Presumably as well, like some asteroids are just like a crumbly mess when you get up close and they're not yeah. really a single object. Could that have been the case and it turned out not to be? Yeah, that's Sabina's finding. So her results, now they've been published, her finding was it was a crumbly mess. Wow. Is, is the short way of putting it. I mean, she defined it as having a bulk density of 2,200 kilograms per cubic meter. And a uh, very small internal cohesion force of less than one pascal. Yeah, that sounds crumbly to me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Real I'm no wow. expert, but whew, that sounds crumbly. <laughs> yeah, if you put it in a pile, it would have an angle of repose of only 29 degrees. <laughs> okay. That's uh, okay. crumbly. I mean. Good crumble. That's what I want all of my uh, cakes and biscuits to be like. Yeah, you the go, angle ah, of repose of my a, cakes and biscuits. Are exactly good that. angle of repose on this crumble. Yeah. <laughs> um, the way she would simulate like, because you've got to build a model of a potential asteroid candidate first uh -huh. and then simulate it being impacted. And the way she would model them is by modeling a bunch of distant particles in the computer mm -hmm. and then simulating them all just kind of clumping together at once. Right. So she would actually simulate the creation of the asteroid first uh -huh. and then simulate something slamming into it. <laughs> and did this for loads of different scenarios and, and you know, worked out which one has the closest plume match i find it really heartening that we're doing that we've done that it's like we are making progress towards planetary yeah. defense and it was the mission as it flew cost a third of a billion u.s dollars mm -hmm. i think that's pretty good it's pretty good that's, that's what pretty money good well spent money, i think like, in know. terms of like on a per person basis bargain uh, i'll take yeah. it trying to eliminate a global existential crisis you know yeah I'd put a lot if of money. If anything, I'm amazed it took us this long, and I would have been happy if we spent more money on it. Yeah. So, in theory, the follow on mission to have a look at the aftermath, which will give us much more information about the impact and things we can then use on future impacts, will launch, uh, should be late. They're planning October 2024. That changes, obviously. If it all goes to plan, you're expecting around Christmas 2026. Currently, the 28th of December, but these things change a lot, obviously. When they launched the impact of DART, it took less than a year to get there because we just pointed at the asteroid and tell it to go fast. Whereas the follow-on mission takes over two years to get there because we want to arrive gently <laughs> and go into orbit around oh, it. yeah. And that's a lot harder to do. It feels like a, a really short amount of time, that first mission. 
And it is just because it doesn't matter if you crash it. Oh, no, actually, that's the point. Like, <laughs> that's the whole point. Yeah. If you don't care how fast you arrive, <laughs> space travel's very straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to slow down <laughs> and go into orbit, yeah. that's going to take it's a yeah, flip yeah, and yeah. burn. <laughs> More strategic. So huge thanks to Sabina Regican at the University of Bern for taking the time to chat to me. And, of course, thanks to my wife who lets me tag along to her important... <laughs> scientific <laughs> conferences <laughs> let me chat to the other scientists <laughs> that is all for this episode thank you so much for downloading this podcast for whatever your local definition of down may be <laughs> it's good to be back in your podcast feed and it's good to be part of the Acash creator network if you're still looking for more detail there are links to download more of my songs you can watch more of steve online and order matt's new book in the show notes don't forget to subscribe to us in your podcasting app of choice and that way you'll get more episodes as soon as they come out and if you haven't listened already our first two series are available they're roughly wherever you found this episode you can follow us on all the social medias all the good ones anyway some of the bad ones as well you can also email us at podcast at festival of the spoken nerd.com let us know what you think or if you have some unnecessary detail for us we'd love to hear it thank Bye. you for listening Bye. Bye. a podcast of unnecessary detail is made by festival of the spoken nerd that's helen arnie steve mold and matt parker this episode was produced by laura grimshaw our theme music is by howard carter and we are proud to be part of the acast creator network thanks for listening <laughs> <laughs>